Now the final part of this lecture is about the concept of balance of power. The balance of power concept is an indispensable concept in international relations. So much so that it is considered to be the nearest thing to a political theory of international relations. And the basic idea is that it is a pattern of interaction between states, which tends to limit countries seeking to become the dominant powers in an international system. So a balance of power is meant to lead to an equilibrium. An equilibrium would be like a stable form of politics between countries. So states naturally try to ensure that there is an even distribution of power and one country becoming too powerful is a problem for countries. Now to help explain this, I'm going to refer to a YouTube video. So this one here. Um, this will be about seven minutes long. It does a very good job of explaining the concept of balance of power. Now during this, I really want you to pay attention to the contents of this lecture, but also try and answer some of the political realism theory in international relations. So let's have a look at the balance of power. Okay, the balance of power. Now, as I said earlier, balance of power uh, can be simply described as a theory of state behavior. And what that really means is that states act to preserve a balance, or if you like, equilibrium of power in the system. So what I thought I'd do is simply draw an international system here for you. And I'm going to populate it with five states. And this is going to assume that all of these states, A, B, C, D, and E, are all roughly equivalent in power, hence their approximate identical size. And the whole idea of this balance of power behavior is that states act to preserve a balance of power in the system to prevent any one of these states from dominating all the others. In other words, if it looks like any of these countries is growing in power to the extent that it could dominate the entire system, maybe even conquer all the other states in the system, these states, these other states, will act to balance that power in an effort to achieve an equilibrium in the system. Now, balancing can be achieved in one of two different ways. The first way states can balance against a growing power is by increasing their own power. So let's use an example. Let's say state A, for whatever reason, experiences a growth in power perhaps a combination of economic and political reasons, state A's power in the system is enhanced. Now, according to the theory of balance of power, these other states are going to be nervous about that, and they're going to want to take measures to ensure that they balance against this growth in power by state A, because they don't want to see state A grow to the extent that is capable of dominating the system, or maybe even conquering all the other states in the system. So they're going to be balancing in one of two different ways. And the first way is by increasing their own power. So let's say state D looks at state A and the government of state D says, hmm, we see that state A has increased its power. We want to balance that power to make sure that state A doesn't dominate the system. And so state D can try to increase their own power. 
and that might involve increasing their military capacity or or so on and the whole idea that of course is that they have achieved an equilibrium or a balance between state a and themselves but not all countries are capable of increasing their power that easily there may be resource constraints and monetary constraints and so on and so the second way to balance power is through alliances and in this case state b and state c may look at the growth in power by state a and think to themselves mm hmm we need to balance against that growth in power but we really don't have the potential to increase our own power so we are going to form an alliance and this idea then of forming an alliance means that states b and c are combining their efforts in order to balance the growing power of state a and so either through increasing their own power or by forming alliances, states engage in this type of balance of power behavior, and therefore the balance of power or equilibrium in the system is maintained. A state A is no longer in a position where it could perhaps come to dominate the system. Now, preserving the balance of power could mean a long period of peace. Uh, for example, if this system that we have here is in equilibrium and stays that way, there might very well be no war in the system. But sometimes, preserving the balance of power does require war. So for example, let's say state A decides to attack state E, for whatever reason. Now in this case, countries B, C, and D are going to be very worried, because if state A conquers state E, it will take the economic power, the resources, the population, and so on of that state and add it to its own, thus vastly increasing its own power. And states B, C, and D are going to want to prevent that. And they'll prevent it by going to war to support state E against state A. In this case, balance of power behavior actually leads to war, because war becomes necessary to restore or maintain an equilibrium or balance in the system. Now, obviously, this is all very dynamic, very fluid, and the relative power of states in the system is in constant flux. It's changing all the time. And so this requires constant adjustments, states increasing their own power or engaging in alliances. And all of this behavior can change over time. Alliances can shift. Uh, today, B and C are in an alliance, but maybe in the future, C and D would form an alliance. And all of that will be determined by who is considered more threatening to the system uh, and how the system's polarity or distribution of power is maintained. The whole idea of this, of course, realists say, captures the entire history of international relations. The history of the rise and decline of state power, the history of shifting alliances, and the whole idea is all of this originates with a basic theory that states are engaging in policies to achieve a balance of power or an equilibrium amongst them in the system to ensure that that system cannot be dominated by one actor. So there are some examples that we can use to help explain the content of the lecture you just saw. So let's refer to Asia. So having uh, listened to and attended the last lecture, which was about China's um, foreign policy, we know that China is trying to increase its power in Asia. In particular, it's trying to remove the U.S. influence from this area, and it is economically becoming much more powerful, too, through the Belt and Road Initiative, meaning lots of investment in these countries, but somewhat controversial investments because um, the terms of these negotiations and the terms of these contracts are usually very favorable to China, and sometimes not very helpful for these very poor countries. Now, the US is still the number one power in Asia. And what we'll do is we'll look at a useful uh, map here. So in terms of uh, military capability, 
we can see that the US military is still the most powerful uh, in Asia. Uh, it has it operates its navy within this area. It has security alliances among these countries here. In terms of economic resources, uh, the US and China, China might be more favorable uh, in a better position at the moment uh, compared to the United States, but the US still has a major role within the region as well. Now, where China has significant problems is in terms of its security alliances. If we look here, so the economic influence is huge, but in terms of its security alliances, it's very, very weak. And the US is very strong. It has these alliances here. So the dominant power in terms of security is still the United States. But if we look at the future, so future resources would be like military and economic resources. We can see that it, by 2030, China is going to be much more powerful. And it will, it is a rising threat. Well, not rising threat, but it is a rising power among uh, within Asia. And some of these countries see that rising threat as being dangerous for their own security. Now let's return to the slides. So the basic idea in terms of Asia's balance of power is the US is still the number one in terms of military and cultural influence. Uh, China is rising fast in terms of its economic influence. Now China's rise is perceived as a threat to neighboring countries. Um, in particular, it's the fact that it is seeking to take control over the maritime jurisdiction of the South China Sea. It is bullying some countries in Asia uh, through both territorial disputes and some unequal uh, trade terms. So many Asian countries are forming closer alliances to balance against the threat of China. And they're trying to seek more secure ties with the US military.